Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. visiting speaker series. Today we welcome James O'Toole to Microsoft Research, here to discuss his latest book co-written with Warren Bennis and Daniel Goleman, a deceptively small book about a very big idea, transparency. What is this transparency? As Bennis describes it in the introduction, transparency encompasses candor, integrity, honesty, ethics, clarity, full disclosure, legal compliance, and other things that allow us to deal fairly with each other. Sounds good, doesn't it? And yet, and with the advance of technology, transparency is actually not an option. It's actually a matter of survival. Yet, as organizations and leaders speak of openness, true transparency is rare as leaders hoard information, corporate structures set up roadblocks to communication, and people are afraid to speak truth to power. In other words, creating a culture of candor, whether it is a country or a company, is harder than it sounds. James O'Toole is the author of over 70 articles and 14 books on leadership management and organizational transformation, and has worked in the government, in academia, and in media. He was also the executive vice president of the Aspen Institute. He is currently the Daniels Distinguished Professor of Business Ethics at the University of Denver. Please join me in welcoming James O'Toole to Microsoft Research. Actually, we... Uh had planned that with the fire department. Everybody knows that the worst time to give a talk is right after lunch. And everybody's sort of falling to sleep. And uh, so we took care of that problem anyway. We got you, got you awake to start with. Now my challenge is to see if I can keep you awake for about the next 35 minutes. Uh, the topic may not you know, appear to be one that uh, is very exciting. Um, it just sounds like in some ways, perhaps uh, a new management buzzword. And I don't think we need any more buzzwords than, uh, th than we have. But actually, this is a pretty useful word, transparency, because I think it puts a name on a whole bunch of real issues that have been in the forefront in the organizations over particularly the last uh, seven or eight years. It's very hard to define transparency, because this is basically kind of an expansive, an all-encompassing word. It just means that you're capable of seeing through something. But the way to understand it, I think, is to think about the opposite of a transparent organization. And the opposite of transparent is opaque. Opacity actually characterizes most organizations in the world today. Opacity um, is a characteristic of secrecy, of closed doors, and the kinds of, of um, surprises that will shatter reputations today as fast as at the click of a mouse. Now, um, I first became aware of opacity as a problem when I was very young. It was 1969, and I had my first job when I was working for McKinsey and Company, leading a transformation of, of a company in a little town across the border up here called Vancouver. And up in Vancouver, there's a company called Macmillan Bloedel, and they were a lumber company. And uh, they were starting to get into all kinds of financial trouble. And they sent the, a team of McKinsey people in to deal with the problems. I remember a, a conversation that I had at that time with uh, one of the managers at Macmillan Bloedel, and I asked him what it was like to work at that company. And in those days, we didn't use the word corporate culture. We talked about the climate of the place. And he said he characterized the climate a little bit like working in a mushroom farm. And I said, well, what do you mean working in a mushroom farm? He said, well, he said, the people here uh, are uh, kept in the dark and they're fed manure. Now, I'd never heard that uh, be before, that metaphor before, and I probably would have forgotten it if it weren't for the fact that since 1969, I've probably worked in several hundred organizations, and the metaphor that I have heard more than any other to describe the culture of the places where I've been working is that mushroom farm. 
This is the way in which most people feel about the companies in which they work. And in fact, there's a tremendous amount of data that leads us to conclude that opacity characterizes most organizations in America as opposed to transparency. We actually recently pulled, pulled some top executives in the Midwest, and we found that 63% of these people, of these top executives, when they're characterizing their own companies, characterized them as being opaque. There was very few who talked about uh, enlightenment or bright sunshine. Most of them talked about their companies in terms of shades of gray. And the problem is found in all kinds of organizations, in government, in professions, in nonprofits. Um, but it really came into focus recently at publicly held corporations like en Enron and WorldCom and Arthur Anderson. Uh, this entire sorry ilk brought to attention the fact that, that organizations are dangerously and self-defeatingly opaque in this country. Now, probably the issue would not have become urgent, but what really changed the nature of it was things that people like all of you were doing, and that is that you were enabling us all with this new technology. And the technology took this issue from being kind of a back burner issue to one that was at the forefront and became at the top of the agenda of a great number of executives in, in, this, in this country. Today, transparency is all but inevitable, thanks to the new technology. Now, there's an interesting uh, aspect of this because uh, it's very paradoxical. What is happening is, is, is the result of the new technology. Uh, the opportunity uh, for uh, privacy uh, has vanished, um, and as well as um, the opportunity for secrecy. We are living in a world in which um, there's increasing enlightenment, but over which we have decreasing control of information. It's a world in which the powerless are made more powerful and more free, but at the same time, it is a rather Orwellian world in which our liberties are becoming more constrained. We saw this uh, in, the, in one of the places where we would least expect to find it to happen, and that is in China. Uh, recently, within the last year or so, in a city called Xiamen, uh, secret plans have been drawn up to build a factory that would produce toxic paraxylene. Now, even a decade ago, the factory probably would have been built before anybody noticed what was going on. But now, thanks to email, uh, blogs, and, and text messages, word spread very quickly in the area around Xiamen, and a protest was organized, and people all came to the, to, the, to the city hall. Well, of course, Chinese officials know how to deal with protests. They called out the police. They arrested people. But as they were arresting people, the, the, the people who were being arrested, the people who were standing by, all picked, out their, picked up their cell phones, and they started taking pictures of the cops. This, this was sent out all over the, the whole region. And, and what it, what the, the net effect of it was that more and more people came to the Xiamen City Hall to protest what was going on. The thing got completely out of hand. The, the, the uh, officials tried to cut down on the websites. They tried to stop the blogging. They tried to do everything that they possibly could. But they found out that the technology was so far beyond them that they could no longer control it the way people had been controlling this in, in, in China you know, for, uh, for, for, for absolute ages. Um, so, so what we saw there was that um, nowhere today can we hide from this new technology because we no longer can hide at all. We can no longer have secrets. The truth is ultimately going to emerge, and the only choice given all of that is for us to embrace it. Organizations need a free flow of information as much as the heart needs uh, oxygen. And leaders who fail to ignore that fact, and they try to fight transparency, soon try, find themselves trying to explain embarrassing cover-ups. I learned about this firsthand when I was uh, relatively young. I, I worked in the uh, Nixon administration, and uh, Richard Nixon tried perhaps uh, the, the biggest cover-up ever to, to occur uh, in, uh, in, in our government. And he failed. And one would have thought that others would have, have learned the lesson from this, but, but after that we had Reagan and Iran-Contra, we had Bush and the WMDs, 
we had Clinton and uh, Monica and Clinton and Jennifer and Clinton and, well, you get the picture. Um, you know what I mean? So if it's happening everywhere. You know, the, the, even when it's happening you know, in China, where the leaders of the Communist Party have been able to shroud themselves in a cocoon of, uh, of secrecy, kind of like the emperors of old sequestered in, the, in the, 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 the imperial palace. But even they have suffered the fates of public exposure. Now, we can think about this in a negative terms. But actually, it should be viewed positively, and particularly from an organizational point of view. An organization's efficiency and its effectiveness depends upon a free flow of information. An organization's capacity to compete, to solve problems, to innovate, to meet challenges, and to achieve goals depends upon a healthy flow of information, a healthy flow of intelligence. It's essential for leaders to receive news and information, even stuff that they don't want to hear, and even from people who are really afraid to bring it to them. They need to get that information fast, and they need to get it very uh, eff effectively. We have some research that shows that companies that have the highest rates of transparency outperform those that have the lowest rates. Um, Inc. surveys of medium-sized companies showed this. But even if you look at big companies, the 34 most transparent companies in the, on the standard, uh, on, on the S&P 500, outperformed the, the, the others that are less transparent by about, uh, by about 12 percent in, in financial terms. Now, what this tells us is that there is a tremendous opportunity for companies to become transparent in terms of just better business sense, in terms of becoming more productive organizations and innovative organizations. At the same time that this is becoming a, a, a apparent, we also have the new technology that is actually forcing it or viewed positively facilitating it. Uh, corporate internal blogs, whether they are um, uh, simply contrarian uh, or perhaps even in some cases wise, are actually benefiting organizations by challenging the dominant assumptions of the leaders. They prevent tunnel vision, and they remind the powers that be that they don't have a lock on truth. Uh, another thing that these blogs are doing is that they help to energize exper expertise from the bottom of organizations. In almost any organization, the information is there. But quite often, almost always, it is not in the C-suite. The information that is really vital is held by somebody way down the line in the organization. In the past, it was difficult to identify those people. Today, it's much easier, and it's much easier to access that information than it has ever been. There's always somebody down in the organization who has the information that is needed, as much as there's always somebody in the organization who knows the secrets that the people at the top are trying to keep. Now, in essence, it is necessary for the right information to get to the right people at the right time in any organization. Now, let me give you an instructive, positive example of this. And it's probably one of the most improbable ones that you could imagine. It's a company that is entirely unlike in the world that you know. It's just sort of the, the opposite of, 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 of your entire experience here at Microsoft. A company called SRC Holdings. It's somewhere in the Rust Belt in the Midwest. And they are in, engaged in the um, most primitive technology they rebuild diesel engines. And the people who rebuild d diesel engines in Rust Belt cities in the Midwest are not like all of you. They tend not to be very well educated. As a matter of fact, at SRC Holdings, um, the average amount of education is less than uh, 12 years uh, in, in, the, in the entire workforce. But when uh, Jack Stack took over that company about 25 years ago, he was a newly minted MBA. And he decided what he would do with these people, many of whom were illiterate, was to teach them everything that he had learned in business school. Uh, he taught them uh, how to read and interpret balance sheets, income, and cash flow statements. And then he made sure that they had access to all financial data and managerial information in the company. So that there were no, all of the numbers, having to do with every single part of the company, 
was readily available to everybody, and everybody was taught how to use those numbers, and they were given the authority to act upon that information. Now, there were two consequences of this. The first one is that once people had that managerial and financial information, the workers started to act as if they owned the place. They started to take initiative and in finding ways to improve uh, efficiency and effectiveness in the company. As a result of that, um, in the space of about 10 years, the value of the company had increased something like 1,000, 2,000 times. And all of the workers owned shares of the company, so they benefited from it. So the company has become a tremendous financial success. Uh, they now have spun off something like 20 companies. They've uh, uh, created all kinds of new jobs for people. It just it has turned out to be a, a tremendous economic success story. <laughs> but at the same time, and almost equally important, during the whole time of all of the corporate uh, scandals at, at WorldCom and, 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 and uh, Enron and the like, this company has never had a hint of scandal. As a matter of fact, they don't worry about all the stuff in Sarbanes-Oxley. They don't worry about internal auditors. They don't worry about uh, having people come in and check the books. As the chief financial officer of the company pointed out, he said, you couldn't cheat around here if you wanted to. It's like having a couple thousand uh, internal auditors when all of the data is available to everybody. So what they have created in this culture of candor in this organization is not only a, 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 an organization in which we see that the benefits of, of having everybody open and no managerial secrets lead to financial success, we also create an ethical culture and one that doesn't have to worry about all of those, those re reporting problems and all the cost of, 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 of internal auditors and all the rest because ethics become a part of the day-to-day -day life in the organization. So there's tremendous value in creating cultures uh, 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 of, of, of candor. Transparency is in the, the self-interest of executives. Um, and it takes, uh, it takes them a while, quite often, for them to understand the value of it, but ultimately they do. Now, in, in, one, in one regard, they're being forced by Sarbanes-Oxley to embrace transparency vis-a-vis -vis their shareholders. But what the, the most far-sighted managers are discovering is that transparency is necessary for all of the stakeholders of a company. All the employees need that information, customers need the information, suppliers, uh, dealers, everybody needs to have a sense that, that the organization is, is fully transparent. Now, it's not easy to do. It is an incredibly difficult thing to do. And, and I'll give you uh, an example that is, I, I think, really quite instructive and certainly illustrative. Um, some of you know who John Mackey is. Uh, he is the CEO of Whole Foods. Uh, many of you probably go there because uh, it, you, you buy great, uh, great food. Uh, the company's a leader in CSR and, and uh, environmental sustainability, and it's always listed as one of the best places to work uh, in, uh, in, in America. Uh, just a really, a really quite marvelous place. And, and one of the reasons why it's so marvelous is because the company's basic culture revolves around their no secrets policy. Uh, as much as at SRC Holdings, uh, everything is open to every employee and all the stakeholders um, at uh, Whole Foods to, to, to a degree that, that, that is actually mind-boggling. For example, most companies believe that the, uh, people's salaries are, are a very important secret to keep. Uh, but at Whole Foods, the salaries of every single person, every single employee in the entire organization are posted and available for, for everybody to, 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 to check on. As a result of this, there's tremendous trust in the organization and a tremendous amount of, of, of initiative and uh, in, in, uh, an incredible sense of, of community. Now, given all of that, one would have thought that John Mackey would see the value of this and be completely committed to, in all aspects of everything that he did, to candor and to transparency. But I don't know if you were following about a year ago when um, Whole Foods was attempting to take over Wild Oats. Now, uh, during the year or so that built up before the, the, the attempted takeover, John Mackey had been blogging using a handle called Rahodeb. And Rahodeb was an anagram for his wife's name, which is Deborah. And what, what Rahodeb was saying online, that is Mackey was saying online on all these various blogs, was how 
how incompetent the CEO of Wild Oats was, how worthless Wild Oats was, uh, what a great company uh, Whole Foods was, and particularly how brilliant John Mackey was. And of course, he thought that he was going to get away with all of this. All right? He would have expected that a person who's talking about uh, the value of a no secrets policy of all people would have figured out that, that there are people who've got nothing else to do on these blogs but to be able to figure out a simple anagram like that and be able to figure out who the hell this guy is who's blogging. So, of course, when does it come out? It comes out just as the SEC is getting, or, or the, F, F, C, the SC, SEC was getting ready to approve the uh, antitrust, uh, to, to apply antitrust, and they nearly lost the acquisition. Okay. They got so close to this because when this came out, it, it was in violation of, of almost all the SEC rules, and here was everything that, that Mackey had worked for was almost lost. Now, how could a guy who was so smart, who should have been learning this lesson, have been so dumb as to have done that? But then you think about it a little bit, even the people who are the smartest when it comes to the technology are making the same damn mistake all along. All right. Stephen Jobs has been, has been called out on, on the web at least two or three times for, for lies. He was called out just as recently as, as last week. All right. now, so, I mean, if anybody ought to understand this stuff, that you can't get away with it anymore, it ought to be them. It just goes to show you how difficult all of this really is. Uh, transparency runs against the grain of natural corporate behavior, and it runs against the grain of human nature. Uh, you know, the, the, the top guys have to hoard information. Uh, there, were, there were just really numerous impediments to transparency. Because if you think about it, rationally, ethically, in terms of efficiency and effectiveness, transparency makes a hell of a lot of sense. But it doesn't happen. It very seldom just happens. Because what we really learn, and we're looking at even the best run companies, leaders are always trying to hide their mistakes. The leaders are trying to control people people trying to control organizations, trying to exert their power by hoarding information. Even some of them view knowledge as a perquisite uh, of power. All the research shows us that effective organizations, to be effective, require clear decision rights. That is, we, ha we have to know in an organization who needs to have the information in order to make the decisions, who's empowered, who has to be in on the decisions. But we don't have that in most companies, so therefore we don't have uh, accountability. There are all kinds of structural impediments, <clears throat> and it starts right at the top. Uh, if we, we look at the, the people who are most likely to act in ways that are not transparent, it's really the CEOs, and it's quite often celebrity CEOs, people like, 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 like Steve Jobs, because there's a shimmer effect around them. And be, uh, celebrity uh, executives get away with murder. Uh, you may have read about... Uh, a man by the name of uh, Conrad Black, at the co a company called uh, uh, Blackstone. Uh, his board closed their eyes while Conrad Black spent $8 million of shareholders' money to, to amass a private, a private personal uh, collection of memorabilia uh, for, for President Franklin Roosevelt. Right? And when board member uh, Henry Kissinger was called up by the Wall Street Journal and asked, you know, weren't you, supposed, weren't you watching out for this guy? He goes about in awe about how marvelous a guy Conrad Black, Black has. His job was to watch Conrad Black. But he didn't. And Conrad Black, like most CEOs, believed that they were entitled. Well, power con confers a sense of infallibility among leaders. Uh, you take even a person like Jack Welch. Jack Welch was getting ready to retire is perhaps the, 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 the CEO with the greatest reputation. But what happened, he'd worked a secret deal on his retirement package. Just as he was co coming out, this retirement package, uh, a blogger found out about it. It came out on, on the internet. Everybody knew about it. And Jack Welch's reputation was tarnished and tarnished forever. What happens? Why does this happen? It's hubris. It's executive ego. Leaders think that they are smarter than everybody else. And they were re reinforced with that at the top of organizations. What you see happening in any organization is that there is a kind of caste system. All right? The fast trackers, the insiders, the good old boys, the golden boys, the A-team, they're the insiders. And everybody else is outsiders. And some people are in the know, and some people get uh, heard, uh, others are left out. And when the, the outsiders are left out, it works to the detriment of the organization 
And in fact, it also works to the detriment of the very leaders who are on the inside. And that, that's the, the, the irony of the whole thing. Now, the value of transparency is that it keeps organizations, and particularly it keeps the leaders of organizations, honest to others and also honest to themselves. Transparency broadens the perspective of uh, insiders because any group, after a while, will start to engage in groupthink. Particularly if you're in the C-suite of an organization, you end up telling everybody else in the C-suite how smart you are and how successful you are and why you want to keep doing what you've been doing in the past. Now, the information that those leaders need can be located anywhere in the organization, and they need unimpeded channels of communication to get it. But they usually regret, reject it because they, 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 they do not have respect for, for the, the, the bearers, uh, the bearers of, of information. Those of you who are Shakespearean scholars know that uh, when Julius Caesar was on the way to the, to the forum, that he ignored the warnings from a powerless outsider uh, to beware of the Ides of March. Big Julie looked at this outsider and said, who the hell are you? You know, I'm the emperor around here. What do you know? And well, we know what happened to Big Julie. Now, another problem today, one that, that, that the Caesars didn't have, but most of us have, is that we all succumb to the myth of speed. We believe that we have to act, have to act now, we have to act quickly, we have to act even without adequate information. We also, if we are a leader, and particularly if we're a man, we believe that it's better to make a bad decision than to look indecisive. All that, of course, is baloney. Uh, of course, uh, uh, you can't have all the relevant information before you act, but you can reduce the risk of a bad decision by just exercising a little bit of prudence. Give you another uh, example, a scientific example this time, of, of what, what I have in mind here. One of the great um, social science experiments was conducted by NASA uh, in the uh, uh, late, late 70s. Um, what they did is they took intact airline crews. They took a pilot, a co-pilot, a navigator, and they put them in a flight simulator, and they simulated an accident in the sky, that, that something would happen in which an accident was I imminent, a, a truly serious accident. Now it ends up, all the research shows, that even at the worst accidents, pilots have at least 30 seconds in which to make a decision. Now, when they simulated, they gave them the information that the pilot got, uh, that the plane was in trouble, the pilots reacted in one of two ways. Most of them were the uh, top gun, take charge, tough flyboys, decisive leaders. And they showed their macho stuff by making a decision right away. It's the way we, we teach them in business school. The other ones stopped for a minute, and they were more inclusive and participative. And they turned to the co-pilot and the navigator, and they said, holy crap, what is going on here? Do you have any information? That takes five seconds. Then they said, um, what do you think we should do? That takes five seconds. Then they still had a good 15 to 20 seconds to make, up the, make the decision, because ultimately the pilot has to decide. Now, the difference between these two approaches, though, was really remarkable, because the tough take charge leaders almost always made the wrong decision and actually put the plane and the passengers in peril. The people who took the couple minutes to gather that information, who understand, who understood that all of us is smarter than any one of us, they made the right decisions, the safe decision. Now, the, Na the uh, NASA uh, researchers went to the crews uh, the, working for the, t the t t take charge guys, and they say, well, look, at when you saw he was making a mistake, why didn't you speak up? The reason why they didn't speak up is because they knew those guys. They knew what would happen if they spoke up. Because they wouldn't listen. And also, when, they, when, when, when the sort of people that if other people tried to come forward with their ideas, they would get dis dissed or, 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 or shot down. They did not trust those pilots to act appropriately on the information that they were getting. That's why they didn't speak up. And that problem repeats itself almost to a T in business organizations. And it also repeats itself even at, at, uh, uh, even at NASA in another experiment found something quite interesting that was quite parallel to it many, many years later. 
remember the challenge here, the problem with the O-rings. Well, what they discovered was that among engineers, there is an unspoken rule that you don't identify a problem if you don't have a solution. All right? So that there were many of the engineers who actually saw that there was a problem. But because of the culture of NASA, you don't speak up if you don't have a, you don't have a solution. As a result, well, you, you have that, uh, that, that, those infamous O-rings. Now, there are many reasons why organizations have blind spots and black holes. To understand this, why it happens in any organization, you have to think about that organization with which we were initially enculturated first, which is the family. Most families have little lies that every family teaches to each of its members. We all know, growing up, that there are uh, things that we notice and things that we don't notice. There are things that we say about, about the problems, things that we don't say about problems. Uh, there are things that we would never say to outsiders, that there are, are certain taboo subjects. Uh, we have a, a father in the family who's abusing the children. We have an alcoholic mother. We find all the, the data shows that, that, that people understand these things, but they never talk about them. They never confront them because they've been properly socialized by the family to not say those things. They know what they can and cannot say. It's the same in business organizations. I worked uh, uh, many years ago for one of the largest tobacco companies uh, in America. And I noticed that every single top executive in the company smoked. And I raised the question. I said, what would happen around here if one of the executives didn't smoke? Right? You know, is, smoking, is it necessary to smoke to get ahead around here? Right? You know, they looked at me like I came from the moon. This was a, a topic that could not be discussed in their culture. And I'm not, I'm not just blaming those people. Professors have the same problem. In, in universities, it's very, very clear. All the research shows that tenure is no good for, te for students, it's no good for professors, it's no good for universities. But nobody can speak out against tenure, right? Because that subject is taboo. And there are those taboos that exist almost everywhere because we're all part of a corporate family. And to be part of a group, we learn what we can and what we cannot say. There's always the office bully that nobody confronts. There's the sales folks who skew numbers to exaggerate expectations. There's the corporate board that fails to rein in an abusive uh, CEO. Why do these things happen? They happen because nobody wants to be the skunk at the party. Nobody wants to rock the boat. Nobody wants to be the one to tell the boss that his fly is open. Now, uh, we recognize this about ourselves. And uh, we laugh at it, but, but we seldom address it. One of the, 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 the ways in which I've seen people laugh at it was at a, a cabaret in Aspen, Colorado. It was called the Crystal Palace. And for 50 years, all of the big fat cats in America <clears throat> went out to, to Aspen. And they would always go to the Crystal Palace uh, to be entertained. And the theme song of the Crystal Palace was a song called Peanut Butter on the Chin. Now, Peanut Butter on the Chin was about a, uh, a CEO who um, was r rather in a hurry one morning to get to work. And he'd been eating some toast with peanut butter on it and got a big blob of it on his chin. But he didn't have time to go to the mirror and to clean up before he had to run, run, run off to the office. And when he got home at night, he discovered at the end of the day, he still had that big blob of peanut butter on his chin. He'd been there the whole day with a blob of peanut butter on his chin. He went in and washed it off, and he was so absolutely embarrassed about it. But of course, nobody mentioned it. Nobody told the boss. Nobody wanted to tell the boss. So he thought, oh, they, they think that I'm such an idiot. He said, you know, I'm going to go in there tomorrow, and I've lost all credibility. This is just the most terrible thing. He was so embarrassed. So he walks back into the office, and you know what? All of the other executives in the company have peanut butter on their chin. Okay? The story tells you two things. All right? First of all, it tells you about the fact everybody wants to belong. The boss has got peanut butter on his chin. I'm going to have peanut butter on my chin. Am I going to tell him he's got peanut butter on his chin, even though he looks like an idiot? No. Right? And so this is part of the way organizations work. This is, this is what, 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 what it means to be part of the culture of, of an organization, to be fully in, 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 enculturated. That's why CEOs have to create cultures of candor, why leaders have to create cultures of candor, where employees are free to speak up, and they are encouraged and rewarded to tell the boss when that emperor is wearing no clothes. Now, before that happens, 
organizations have to address the oldest of all organizational issues. That is one that Kim mentioned earlier, which we call speaking truth to power. Now, we have to start by recognizing the fact that the truth that makes men free is the truth that, for the most part, men prefer not to hear. And I speak about men advisedly, um, because this issue of, the, of, the, of the, the importance and the problems and the perils of speaking truth to power became apparent to this country in 2002 when Enron's Sharon Watkins, WorldCom's Cynthia Cooper, and the FBI's Colleen Rowley were named Time Magazine's Persons of the Year. They, they were named that because they had the courage to bring news to the men at the top of their organizations that those men did not want to hear. And the issue that Time reported on was how these women were received by their organizations and by their bosses for their efforts to actually try to save their organizations. They were marginalized, they were isolated, they were reviled, they were scorned by their own bosses and by their own co-workers, much as Antigone was put to death when she acted on principle in the year 400 uh, BC. It takes tremendous courage to stand up and to tell the boss that the boss has peanut butter on his chin. What motivates a person to, to have such courage? What motivated those women? Well, it was actually what they saw as a violation of an important moral principle. In Martin Luther King's words, our lives begin, begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. To those women, those three brave, courageous women, uh, they can no longer remain silent because it was a matter of moral principle. So when we speak of creating cultures of candor, what we're really talking about is not just creating organizational effectiveness, but we're talking about a moral imperative. Now, some of you are, are uncomfortable here with, uh, with this talk because we're talking about culture and organizational culture, and suddenly we're talking about morality and, and, and ethics. But in fact, they are all one and the same. And we have to go back to the ancient Greeks to understand this. The word for culture in Greece is ethos. And we talk about the ethos of a company. We talk about the culture of a company, which means the character of a company. It is also the same Greek word that is the root for the word of ethics. Ethics has to do with the character of the individual. Ethos has to do with the character of the organization. <coughs> Creating the culture of candor has to do with, with, with the moral character of the organization. Now, we have had, in the last couple of months, a marvelous example of the perils involved in speaking truth to power. This, we, we, we had uh, front page news about this when um, Scott McClellan uh, wrote a book talking about um, uh, the administration's, the Bush administration's fabricated rationale for invading Iraq. When he came out with his book, he was immediately slammed on the right for being disloyal, and he was slammed equally on the left for lacking moral courage and waiting until it was out of harm's way before he spoke up. Well, anybody who's being slammed on both the left and the right can't be all bad, right? So let's think about him for a minute before dismissing his uh, tardy dallying with the truth, a simple spineless uh, kiss and tell exercise by a disgruntled former employee. I think it's worth weighing the moral value of McClellan's act in light of a considerable body of social science knowledge. Because it turns out that in all organizations, families, sports teams, corporations, those lower down the pecking order will from time to time experience the terror of having to tell unpalatable truths to those people who are ranked above them. Now, few of us have to call attention to Iraqi style um, uh, uh, fraud and deception, but most of us have experienced uh, um, retaliatory fury from rather enraged alpha dogs who we've mustered the courage to confront. My own case, I had, a, a, in the early 1990s, a, a, a quite telling uh, experience of this. Um, I was at a conference in Aspen in which there was a CEO there at the time, and his name was Donald Rumsfeld. And uh, Mr. Rumsfeld made a, um, a, a point uh, during the conference, and I questioned the factual basis of what he said. And I, I, I'll never forget. When I, when I questioned him, he came after me with bone-chilling intensity. He was, his face was red and angry, and he was coming at me, and I thought he was going to kill me. And he said, no one questions me, 
Do you understand that? I am never wrong. Look at the guy. I mean, I, I was still shaking from the encounter hours later. And a couple of days later, I learned that he tried to get me fired. I remember that uh, when, we, when I started reading about uh, McClellan and thinking about those women uh, at Enron and, and WorldCom and places like that. Because daring, sp daring to speak truth to power often entails considerable risk, whether it's at the hands of a, an irate parent, a neighborhood bully, or an incensed boss. Imagine the courage it would take to, for um, Sharon Watkins to have it to face Jeff Skilling and tell him about uh, his and the company's uh, financial deception. Even at, at General Electric, under Jack Welch, uh, nobody would dare to question the boss. Nobody would ever question uh, Jack Welch. Uh, he um, berated, he insulted, and he abused people. Even one of his closest followers said the following about him. He conducts meetings so aggressively that people tremble. He attacks almost physically with his intellect, criticizing, demeaning, ridiculing, humiliating. I talked to one head of a division, a former head of a division at General Electric, and he said he dared to question Jack Welch at a meeting in front of a lot of his peers, and Jack Welch came after him the way uh, Rumsfeld came after me, and, and this poor man admitted that he said, I soiled my pants. He was practically in tears. Can you imagine what, 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 it, what courage it takes to speak up to some of, these, uh, uh, some of these very tough bosses. In the 1970s, there was a professor at MIT by the name of uh, Albert Hirschman, and he posited the following. He said that employees who disagree with company policy only have three options, exit, voice, or loyalty. That is, they can uh, offer a, principal, a principled resignation, that's exit, or they can try to change the policy, that's speaking truth to power, or they can remain loyal team players despite their opposition. Well, research shows that most people choose option three, the path of least resistance. Most people swallow whatever moral objections they may have to questionable dictates from above because they conclude that they lack the power to change things, or worse, that they're going to be punished if they attempt to change them. All of the scientific data supports Hirschfeld's thesis. In a survey of a cross-section of American workers, over two-thirds report having personally witnessed unethical behavior on the job. But only a third of those also reported what they had done, what they had seen to their supervisors. Why did these people who saw something terrible at work, why did they not tell their supervisors about it? The reasons that the, those people gave for their reticence ranged from fear of retaliation to, the, to the, the belief that management would not act on the information appropriately. That is, they simply did not trust their bosses. Now, docile employee behavior is assumed. Most, ex most people believe that, that their people are going to go along with what they say, that they're going to be good soldiers, that they're not going to uh, question company policy, or if they do that, they're going to go away quietly. And when they, if, they, if they go away noisily or if they, they make a fuss, they're accused of disloyalty because disloyalty is obviously the organization's uh, uh, trump card. Um, experience shows that employees who muster the, 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 the courage to question prevailing groupthink in an organization open themselves to charges of disloyalty. And that's why most people have to be really teed off before they will, will go public. To get angry enough to face an onslaught on one's character requires not only fundamental disagreement on policy, usually involving a, a, a moral principle, but also some deep personal hurt. Um, if you, you remember seeing that movie, The Insider, about the, uh, the, the scientist at cigarette maker uh, Brown and Williamson, um, uh, he, he finally became a whistleblower, but it was only after he had been really, really badly mistreated by the company. And once he had been badly mistreated and he went public, the company responded with a standard organizational response that they use against all whistleblowers, which is that the testimony should be discounted because these employees were disgruntled, angry, nutcases uh, with enough um, skeletons in their closet uh, to outfit a Halloween ball. Now, McClellan is getting pretty much the same uh, treatment today. And the charge of disloyalty is easy for, for leaders to bring against followers, and it's very hard for the accused uh, to uh, counter or to disprove. And, and moreover, we have to realize that loyalty is an admirable uh, trait. Uh, but it's also a conveniently um, 
a safe blind for cowardly followers to hide behind. Now, if you look at what's happened in recent times in the Bush administration, Treasury Secretary Paul O'Neill, uh, economic advisor Lawrence Lindsay, pollster Matthew Down, national security expert Richard Clark, ex-Army chief uh, Eric Shinesky, all of them left the administration and the, the response was that they were all disloyal and too angry to be trusted. Well, th obviously they weren't too angry, they'd still be on the inside trying to change things, but they tried that and it didn't work. And I think we have to be careful not to demand that pe when people do step forward, either that they not be angry, because if, if, if that's what we demand and we, we immediately assume that they're disloyal, I think that fewer and fewer people are going to step forward and there are going to be fewer safeguards on the, uh, the public interest. I think what, what, what we've learned uh, from the whistleblowers in um, both government and whistleblowers in business uh, over the last decade um, is that we should cut some slack to people who don't speak up uh, when they're in power and who step, step outside and, and, and finally do. As I said, you have to keep in mind that speaking truth to power is um, uh, uh, dangerous and the truth that makes men free is often the truth that those leaders prefer not to hear. And what is required is not only a courageous speaker, but also a willing listener. And we need both of those things in order to have a, a true culture of candor. If you're interested uh, in during the, the Q&A period, I can give you some examples of how business leaders are creating cultures of candor, people at all levels in an organization. It's not just the people at the top. But what we found in our research was that the very best companies in America, very best companies in terms of their effectiveness and also in terms of their ethics, were almost all governed by one rule when it came to information. And that rule is this. When in doubt, let it out. Any questions, comments? i give you some examples. Wh whatever, please. The question I have is in regards to organizational transformation and creating a culture where employees um, default to uh, giving voice to their concerns instead of defaulting to kind of like being quiet and, and going along with things. What are some of the traits that you've experienced in organizations that drive for that kind of culture? And what advice would you have for us individually and collectively to, to create that kind of environment? You say, how do you create a climate in which people are willing to, to, speak, to speak out? Well, um, there are several things that are, that are, that are necessary. And you, clearly, the, the fundamental ethical issue that you're talking about is trust. Right. People will speak out when they know that it's safe to speak out. If people get punished for speaking out, people don't get promoted, people turn into outcasts as a result of speaking out, they're not pay, paid attention to, people get the message very, very quickly. All right. So trust is something that, that, that accrues over time. All right. is, trust is not something that, that, that you can do in one day. Trust is something that you earn over a long period of time by behavior that, that, that causes the followers to know that they, that they are safe. And not only are they safe, but they are actually rewarded for speaking out. Um, uh, let, let me give you an example of, of, of how one of the ways in which it's created. It's a personal example that I had. There was a man uh, who some of you may have, may have heard of in, in, a, in a related industry to yours. Uh, his name is Bob Galvin, and he was the CEO of a company called Motorola. And Bob Galvin got his job the old-fashioned way. Uh, he inherited the company from his father. And uh, Bob was a C student in engineering uh, at um, Notre Dame. And he knew to get ahead, he had to hire a lot of guys who were A students. And to hire them, he also had to listen to them and to make sure that they were free to speak up, speak up to him. Even though he owned the company, they had to be free to talk to him. And he, did it, he, he showed it every single thing that he did, day after day after day, that it was safe. And I was walking down uh, uh, in, in the, uh, about, probably about the year 1980, I was at the headquarters in Schaumburg and walking down the, the corridor with Bob Galvin. And Bob Galvin looked like uh, he got his job not from inheriting it, but, but through, from central casting. He really looks like his CEO. He's one of these really distinguished guys. You know, he was, he was in his late 50s at the time, you know, shock of white hair, very handsome, tie, just really looked marvelous as a leader. And um, this young guy, 
uh, comes running down the hallway in Schomburg. He's dressed like you. He comes up to, to, the, to the old man. He grabs him like that. He's probably 27 years old. He looks at him. He says, Bob, I heard what you said in that meeting this morning, and you're dead wrong. I'm going to prove it, and I'm going to shoot you down. The kid charges off. And I go, holy Christ, the kid's career is kaput. You know, you don't talk that way to the guy who owns the company, to the boss. And I looked up, and there was Galvin, and he was absolutely beaming. And, and, I, and I said, you know, what's wrong with this picture? And he said, that's how we've overcome T Texas Instruments' lead in semiconductors. And he said, around here, he said, the reward goes not to those who tell me when I'm right, because there's no value in that. It goes to the people who show us when we are wrong, who shows us when we are making mis a mistake. He said, even if I'm the one who's causing the mistake. But that, what Bob Galvin did every single day, every single day that he was the CEO, he went in and there was a table in the, the dining hall at, uh, at, at Schaumburg. And no executives were allowed to sit there. No top managers were allowed to sit there because they could get to Bob at any time. But Bob would sit there in the employees would come. And the different ones came all the time. And when people saw year after year after year that this guy was open, that it was safe, then he created that kind of culture of trust and that kind of culture of, of candor. Now, once you lose that, it is very, very hard to regain because you can lose all of that in one fell swoop, just one fell swoop. And that's the hard thing about, uh, the hard thing about trust. Now, I can tell you about how some companies go, go, about, go about doing this in a, in a practical way. There's a CEO at a company um, called, let me, let me see what it's called, it's DeVita or something like that. I can never remember the name of the company. I never, I, I, I thank God I haven't used their product because they, they make kidney dialysis machines. Um, his name is Kent Theory and he's the CEO of DeVita. What this CEO does is he meets regularly with all of his employees and he asks for candid feedback both about himself and about the company. In addition to that, he systematically collects data from employees, from ex-employees, from suppliers, from dealers, from customers, all trying to make sure that the company is not doing things that's going to cause them to screw up. Now, this is a small, co a small company. I mean, this is like most of you probably run a bigger company uh, than, 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 than he runs. But his entire approach to leadership is based upon speaking truth to power, upon, upon candor, upon um, absolute and utter transparency. And so the people understand when he meets with them. You know, w w normally when you ask the people who work for you, how are things going? They say, eh, they're going OK. He never accepts that. He says, no, they're not going OK. Things are never going OK in an organization. There are always problems. What are the problems? One case, they, they just going through a merger. And he asked the people, he says, how's the merger going? He says, ah, it's going fine. Two cultures are coming together fine. And, and, and Theory says, no, they're not. Two cultures never come together well. He says, there are real problems here. Unless you talk about these things and you make them open, we can't deal with them. He's constantly pushing people to, 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 to get the problems out. Because once they get out, then you can work on them, and then they go away very, very quickly. It's when, it's when they fester that that's when the problems occur. Any other questions, comments? Sorry, that's a long answer. How, how do you attribute success in companies that do have a culture of secrecy? You know, you know we, we don't know how, and, and I, I've been working on this problem now probably for about 35 years, um, starting with my friends at McKinsey, uh, Peters and Waterman, and trying to figure out how do you account for success in an organization? All right, we don't know how. We can't even answer that question. All right? All right. What we do know is that in terms of the behavior of leaders, the leaders can be successful if they take the high road or the low road. Right? That, that we have examples of leaders who actually are unethical, who um, don't listen to anybody else, who are stubborn, pig-headed, uh, and the kind of person who you wouldn't want to have a beer with, right? but who are incredibly successful. We also have examples of people you know, who are really good people who develop their people, who listen to their people, who help them grow and to become leaders themselves. Right? And there's absolutely no correlation between success between one and the other. The, 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 the lesson of that is you got a choice. You don't have to do it. You don't have to take the low road. You actually can take the high road and be a success. That's the good news. It doesn't mean that if you, t if you take the high road that you will be a success, but also if you take the low road, it doesn't mean you're going to be a success either. We don't know what causes you to be a, su a success. 
right? Maybe it's luck. Right. But the good news is that, that, that these ethical questions are questions of which we have a choice. You have a choice to be open to your people. We think, from the, the research that we have, that if you are open, you increase your chances of success because what you do is you inform the decisions that you're making. And an informed decision is going to be a hell of a lot better than a decision that's not informed. Just as simple as that. Yes, sir. So in, in your research, have you seen or, or can you recommend uh, for, for people in an organization or, or in a culture who want transparency, but the people in power are, are too powerful to let it happen and, and won't? Mm -hmm. Well, I personally believe that every leader has a responsibility to develop his or her followers. At the same time, every follower has a responsibility to develop his or her leader. Right. <clears throat> One of the um, biggest challenges that any but in an organization faces, is how do you tell your boss the bad news? Right. Now, I, it is morally, when the boss is doing something that is clearly self-defeating for the boss, and, and certainly when it is, self it is harming the, the organization, we all have responsibility to get that message across. We know that some people don't listen. They say you have to have a willing listener. The challenge then is to, for each of us is to find the way in which we can have that conversation with, with, with your boss. And of, of sort of all of the, the sort of um, skills that a manager needs to have, one of them that the people never talk about, but which I think is very important, is the skill involved in having difficult conversations. If you think about what, what's the most difficult conversation that any of you have to have, it is if you have somebody working for you is when you have to do the annual evaluation and you have to tell them that they're not doing well. Nobody wants to have that conversation. And it's so hard to tell somebody, look, you're screwing up. Look, you're not going to get a raise. Look, if you keep doing it the way you're going to do, you're going to get fired. Right? Nobody wants to have that conversation. But there are all kinds of difficult conversations that are like that, including perhaps even a more difficult one is when you have to tell your boss that your boss is the one who is, is screwing up. A friend of mine, uh, uh, just recently retired, he's an executive at the Northrop Corporation. He said, one of the most important skills we all need to have is learning how to have difficult conversations. And the only way you can do it is by practicing. He said that, that if we can, each of us understand that it is to our benefit and the benefit of the organization, if we can learn, first of all, you know, how can you tell somebody bad news, either for the people below you or the people above you? you are going to be a much more effective leader and it's going to be much better for the organization if you can learn how to do that. This requires what my uh, colleague Dan Goldman, who is a co-author of it, some of you know about Dan Goldman, wrote a book called Emotional Intelligence. <clears throat> what Dan is talking about is really, this is really emotional intelligence, being able to, to, to find the way to bring that message to your boss or to the people below you, the message that they don't want to hear. And uh, it is perhaps one of the rarest uh, traits that there is, but it's something actually that can be learned if you practice it. And, and I think it is one of the, really one of the most important skills. And I, you know, I've seen people do it. I've seen people get to bosses who were doing stuff that was really dumb and who for, the, for all the world would have said there was no way that this person would ever have listened. And people found a way, whether it was offline, um, whether by, through um, analogy, um, whether through um, getting them to go to attend a course, whether uh, helping them get a coach, whether going to their bosses, whether going to their peers, or with the CEO, going to a member of the board, one way or another, finding a way to get the information to the person so that the person has a chance to change. I just think that, 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 that although it isn't easy, it is clearly an, imp uh, uh, a, a, an organizational imperative as well as a, as a moral imperative. We learn how to have those kinds of difficult conversations. It doesn't help you, yeah, you because know, you still don't know how to do it. Practice, practice, practice. That's how you get to Carnegie Hall. Yeah. Um, with all the candor and feedback, how do you prevent it from becoming a zoo with everyone arguing about different things? Okay, all right. It's a really good question. You know that that I, I, you know, I, I only had a few minutes here, and, and I went pretty quickly through all this. I said you need to have both a, a you have to have a willing listener, 
but you also have to have a virtuous speaker. And it isn't the case that all candor is good. This gets back to this, this question here, too, you know, that, that how do you have these difficult conversations? I mean, you don't want, there's no reason to uh, uh, bring up people's personal lives. There's no reason to uh, uh, let information, uh, personal information out. That should all be very private. As a matter of fact, one of the problems with the new technology is, 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 is having legitimate privacy, keeping legitimate pr privacy. Um, you also, you know, we don't want the world to know uh, what Microsoft's uh, uh, next generation of, of product is going to look like. That's a legitimate secret. You've got to keep those secrets. And we were talking about that. For, before one speaks truth to power, there are several kinds of ethical tests that must be met. All of this, or the, it really requires moral reflection before one speaks truth to power. You have to ask the first question, the most important question is, is, what, is it in fact truth? How do I know that it's truth? Have I done, really done my research and I know that I'm, whatever I'm telling the boss, that it really is actually factually true? The second is that whatever that truth is, it can't do any harm to innocent people. You know, because there's collateral damage that can occur by, t by, by speaking the truth. In a lot of innocent people can get hurt. You have to be very careful that, w that when, when you convey information, whatever information that you're bringing out, that, that, it, that it is um, done in such a way that innocents are not harmed. Equally important and related to that is that when, before speaking truth to power, for, before it can be virtuous, it has to be in the interest of the organization or in the interest of others. That is, self-interested speaking truth to power is not virtuous. You're just speaking up because you're trying to advance your own position, because you're angry at somebody, because you want to get even with somebody, your grandstanding, none of that stuff is virtuous. What is true, what is virtuous is we're, I, I'm, I have to speak up because the organization is being harmed or because you yourself are harming yourself, then you can speak truth uh, to, uh, to power. And, 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 and just, we have to be realistic about this too. There is no virtue in speaking up if there is not at least a chance for success. There's no virtue in tilting at windmills. And so therefore, you have to make sure that you've thought this all through and, and thought through in a morally ethical way and in a strategic way, how's the best way to get this message across so, so that it has at least a chance of succeeding. Just barging in and telling the boss something he doesn't want to hear probably will get you thrown out of the office. Um, so, so, so this is not easy. It is not easy. And, and, and it, is, it requires real moral imagination to be able to figure out how do you get information to people who don't want to hear it. And there are all these kinds of, it takes some real reflection. It's not just something that, that you do off, uh, 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 on the fly or off the cuff. Any other question? Yes, sir. So, so one thing that's usually uh, secret it's in, in an organization is the salaries of people. And um, you could say it makes sense because it, it helps you the organization minimize uh, the amount of money they have to pay their employees uh, while they're still happy. So how do you think about that? Should it, should okay, well, so okay, this, this one is you, you have raised, which is in the eyes of most organizations, is the most difficult question, but in fact is actually the easiest. Most companies have all kinds of reasons why they can't post salaries. All kinds of reasons. And the employees, because they do not have access to that information, always assume the worst. All right. They assume that, that, the, that some people are getting more than they're actually getting, that the people who are not high performers aren't getting very well paid, that the whole system is rotten and unfair because it is hidden. Research shows, my colleague Ed Lawler, who I've worked with many, many years, done a lot of research on this, is that once salaries are posted, two things occur. First of all, everybody's interested and they go look. The second thing is that they almost all discover that it wasn't as bad as they thought it was, and therefore the issue goes away. And so that all the mistrust that was building up around this and all this misperception, when people actually see it, most of the time people get roughly what, they, what, you, know, what you think they were getting, what they should be getting. You know, very few companies, it's, it's really badly skewed. It's nowhere nearly badly skewed as, as you assume it is when you don't know what, what actually happens. All right. <clears throat> and so the, the post thing, this is really a marvelous example of the benefit that comes about as a result of full disclosure. Because what does, it, it gets back to, to the issue that was raised in the back. It's one of those things that you do to build trust 
in, a, in, an, organ, in, in an organization. And it just, it's, it's a very nice first step, and it's actually a relatively easy thing to do. And although the, the people are trying to hoard this stuff like mad, when it goes away, they say, well, oh, that's so stupid. Why the hell did I try to hoard that? It doesn't make any difference. It ends up not making any difference to anybody. Yes, sir, in the back. In, in your research, what um, have you found? Um, in, in your research, what, what, did, what did your data tell you about uh, the perception around the level of transparency that, that Microsoft is? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I have, I have absolutely <clears throat> no, uh, uh, no, no data whatsoever on that, on that subject. Um, but, but you know, you know the answer. You know the answer. Okay, you know the answer, and, and, and the question is, you know, how can you get people talking about the issue? All right, because the only way in which the issue of transparency is going to get addressed, and it sounds like a chicken and egg proposition, is if you raise it. All right, so you have to find out how can you get the issue of transparency as part of the currency of discussion, and how can you work that up? How can you find that? All right, you know, it ends up that actually, you know, this transparency is kind of a shorthand for lots of problems that organizations have. And it is a kind of useful word once managers start to use it. Um, you know, we, we, we had an ex example of that uh, uh, today with Starbucks. You know, um, Howard Schultz, who should know better, Howard Schultz is, is a, 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 a protege of my colleague, um, uh, Warren Bennis. And Warren is telling him all along the, the, the importance of transparency, the importance of transparency. And here he's been for the last couple of months trying to keep secret what stores they're, they're, they're closing down. Right? And as a result of that, the, the, the climate inside Starbucks has gotten very bad. The level of trust is getting very bad. The respect that people had for uh, Schultz is going down. Right? Now, as, as Kim mentioned the other day, he's finally now releasing some information. And he's saying, I think it's important to become transparent because he's seeing you know, the cost of it. And so uh, it, it is a very, very useful concept for, for top executives to have. Once they see the benefit of transparency, they will start to use it, and it will start to become a part of what they, what they need to do. I would, was, of course, hoping here, and kidding myself, as, as all professors do, that maybe Mr. Ballmer would be sitting here in the room, and he could hear this message, and he could start from the top. But it's, I'm going to have to leave it up to all of you to get him the message. Very good. Thank you. Thank you.